the Lord together. We're going to worship God together. Let's put our hands together.
morning for God to help us. We're a desperate people. Amen. Subject to life and trials and pain and sorrow. But you know what? God can bring us through every obstacle, every uh, demon of fighting you're against right now. God can clearly do miracles for us. And we're going to believe God for Greg and Lisa Mitchell. Let's pray for the moralesis and believe God for uh, all of Prescott, Arizona, that congregation, those faithful pillars throughout the years, investing in the work and investing their time and their savings and the souls that have been impacted because of their faithfulness. Amen. Are you and I, we're in our right minds. We're so grateful for our grandmother church. Let's pray that God blesses the Cassios, the Galvans, and the Hearts. And also, let's remember to pray for Paul and Linda Campo in Cape Cod. We're going to pray for Chip and Lori Ganeer. Let's pray for the Suspanskis and the Kings and uh, the Spicers. Let's also remember to pray for uh, my pastor, Pastor Keith and Kerry Sullivan. Can we lift his name up this morning? When you pray, can you pray, God help Pastor Keith and Kerry Sullivan and uh, that congregation and all that they're uh, going through the miracles that are occurring and the new families that are added there. Let's pray for their success and let's pray for their furthering of the gospel as uh, they have three churches that have been planted. Let's pray for financial success there uh, and their support. Let's pray for this church specifically to get off support. Amen. We have a little ways to go. Let's pray for more people 
to get saved and to respond to the gospel and become pillars here and see the value of a local mother church. Amen. And what God is doing here. Let's also pray for, amen, these local requests here. We had a number of visitors last week, amen, for our Ralph Blanco revival. Let's pray for their lives to be changed uh, and uh, the five souls that were added to the kingdom of God who prayed for salvation and those miracles. Let's lift up this morning uh, Wayne and Dee Dee. Amen. Let's pray also for Rico's mother. Let's pray for the Spanish family who prayed. Amen. The father and the mother and daughter. Let's pray for uh, the great uh, the great effectiveness that Ralph Blanco had upon our area here and the souls who were impacted. Let's also pray for our police and firefighters and Debbie and Gina, amen. Michael needs to get back in church. We're believing God for that young man and his family. Uh, the new church in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, let's pray for Rick Gifaldi. Uh, let's pray for our brother Tom to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, let's pray for Matt Huey. Let's pray for David Berglund's not feeling well this morning. Amen. Let's pray for a healing to his body. And let's pray for all the other folks that are missing this morning, that God will bring them tonight uh, and bring them hungry for the Word of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Maybe there's a need in your life that I did not mention yet. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand, and we're going to pray with you, and we're going to come alongside you. Amen. God sees your hands. Let's go ahead and pray, and you speak out those prayers that you need uh, to see accomplished. Pray for uh, Pastor Keith and Kerry Sullivan. Let's believe God together, and I'm going to seal it when we subside. Let's cry out, church. Lord, you're an awesome God. There's nothing withheld from you. God, you can do the impossible, God. You are a way maker, God. You can do creative miracles, Lord God. You can bring finances, God. You can uh, change hearts, God. You can uh, cause us to surrender to you, Lord God. Touch and save the, those uh, who were witnessed to last night, God. I pray for those in Syracuse. Bless uh, uh, Pastor Matt and Sarah Stoll as they're, they're laboring, God. I pray for the uh, grand opening services, God. Bless uh, Pastor Keith as he's going to preach this morning, Lord God. We're asking you, God, for your outpouring of your Holy Ghost, God. Nothing is withheld from those who will believe on you. Nothing is withheld from those who are desperate and crying out to you, God. We believe you this morning for mighty signs and wonders to follow them. That believe you, Lord God. You're an awesome God. And we come to you this, this morning by the blood of Jesus. And we're going to conquer every fear right now. We believe you for every lie to be exposed up. Disperse and dispel uh, the anxiety and the worry and the doubt, God, I pray. Bring miracles to pass, God. Reaching Greece, God. Give us the souls that you promised. I lift up Pastor Keith uh, and Kerry Sullivan. God, bless the work in Rochester. I pray for their converts, uh, their new families, God. The new ministries that are rising up there, God. We pray for all those uh, uh, who have recently come to Christ, God. We're believing you, God, for the miraculous, God. We're believing you for impossible things, God. That you can save them and you can heal their bodies, God. Break disease and infirmity, Lord God. And cause us to look forward to the fruitfulness that you've designed. We thank you for what you're going to do this morning, God. We're careful to always give you the glory and always give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God together. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I want to thank everybody for coming. Let's take a minute to greet one another. Make everyone feel welcome. Amen.
great to see you in church. Amen. Where God is, we're thankful that you're here. Let's uh, uh, make a few announcements, and that is tonight we will be back. Uh, we always have a Sunday morning service at 1030. Amen. Our evening service is at uh, 530 for prayer, and we will meet at 630 for another sermon that I prepared for this congregation. There's a bunch of people that come at night, and so if you come back tonight, you will meet them. Amen. And uh, you can link hearts with them. We also have a midweek service. There's other people that like to come on Wednesday. I'm going to encourage you to come as much as you can, because then you'll meet everybody, and God will bless you, and this church will simply, amen, be uh, rooted and grounded, and we'll see revival here in Greece. Amen. Saturday, we'll be outreaching again at 11 o'clock. We like to go into the local community and take the gospel outside of the four walls of the church, hand out flyers, witness, uh, and tell people our testimony and how good God is Amen. An exciting place to be. Also, I'd like to bring to your attention the uh, conference, Prescott International Bible Conference. If you'd like to live stream some of the services, this one's entitled Fanning the, Fanning the Flame. Amen. We have some wonderful uh, preachers of our fellowship. Of, amen. That will be ministering in that time. Pray for me. I'll be traveling. Our service will be covered on, on that Wednesday, which is a, a week from this Wednesday. And uh, God will richly reward you for your faithfulness as you are in your place. Amen. Looking to see uh, what God has for your life. And at the same time, helping the church to be established. Uh, helping this place to, amen, grow. Amen. And if there's no further announcements, uh, I'd like to uh, give an offering. And this is called an awesome discovery from 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 10. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house. And have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work. You see, they were repairing the temple. They were building the walls and fixing the doors and, and investing in that. Uh, and uh, Shaphan the scribe showed the king the book. And Hilkiah the priest said, give me the book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Amen. You know, God brings revelation to those who are faithful to give. Those who are liberal. They were investing in their church. The temple needed repairs. There was money that had to be spent uh, uh, on the workers and the laborers and uh, uh, the materials and the lumber and the silver and the gold. And, and everything was invested in the house of God. And because they were faithful to do that, an awesome discovery was made. And that was the word of God, which had been lost for several years and decades. And they finally recovered it. And they were filled with so much joy. Amen. Let's give to the work today. Amen. As God has richly rewarded you. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Amen. The tithes that you give are holy and offerings besides. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for our jobs. We thank you for the health that you put in our bodies. And we believe you for future success in our lives, God. I pray that you would take our tithes and offerings, God. And we cheerfully give to you, knowing that these are eternal investments in souls and future uh, generations, perhaps different churches being planted from here, God. Young people getting born again and saved and converted. We thank you for uh, this time, this opportunity to give, God. Bring great joy into our lives as we surrender our finances to you as you see fit. I thank you. Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Would you like to you want to take the offering? Just take the offering. We'll go ahead and I'll start the sermon. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for your giving this morning. Yes. We greatly appreciate your faithfulness to the work. And those who are giving online, you can click the link. And hopefully successfully you can uh, you know, connect it to that account. And God will bless you. Amen. So we're going to uh, look this morning at the job of an evangelist. Amen. 
An evangelist is faithfully to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ, one man writes here. To make the sinner aware of his sins, to correct with compassion, to encourage with hope and to never lose hope in or belief that man is beyond redemption. This can only be accomplished when one is willing to fulfill his ministry. And we just got done with a tremendous revival with Ralph Blanco from Prescott, Arizona, our grandmother church. It was an amazing time. Amen. Which grew from a small number on Sunday evening uh, from about a dozen, went up to 17, and then it was 19, and then it went to 22 on the final night. And uh, I want to talk about the job of an evangelist because it's completely scriptural. Ephesians 4.11, and God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. These groups of men all have a function. They have a job to do. They have something of great value and some would consider them gifts to the church. <coughs> For the perfecting of the saints, there's a job that needs to be done. And God has given us pastors and give us teachers and people who are over us to help us so that we can become matured, so that we can be strengthened in our inner man. We can be taught for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Kind of like a doctor in a hospital or like the nurse. They're all working together to bring health and success and healing so that eventually the patient can leave the hospital and go and, and live productive. And this is kind of like what happens here in church. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <coughs> Recently we had revival with Ralph Blanco. And I thought it would be a great idea to uh, review some of the highlights of uh, what Ralph Blanco preached. I haven't preached the scripture yet. We're not there yet, if that's what you're worried about. No. Um, and uh, Ralph Blanco is an evangelist who serves a function in our fellowship. And that is that he's an evangelist, a full-time evangelist. He uh, goes out on the road. He makes appointments to preach in different churches that we have. And he goes out for two weeks at a time, perhaps. Then he comes back home. He's able to spend time with his wife and family for a week. And then he goes and does it again. And so this function, there's a unique quality with every evangelist that we see that produces fruit. There's something special about an evangelist. They carry uh, some extra thing. I, it's kind of hard to define, but there's a, a, certainly an anointing that's upon them that is different than a pastor, your regular pastor, or maybe somebody who is, uh, you know, a friend of yours. Now, this is a bit of a recap of what he preached and what we can hope to see in the very near future. I'd like to read our scripture at this point. And this is 1 John 1. I'd like to read that. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, which was manifested to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy might be full. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. God, open up every heart. God, touch every mind this morning, Lord God, yes. with the ministry, the power of your word, and the function of an evangelist. God, as we recall and we recap 
the wonderful time we had last week in the spirit of God, in the excitement of revival, God, so that we can uh, uh, embrace it, so that we can uh, activate, so that we can, uh, amen, engage what you called us to do so that you can be glorified and eventually that our joy might be full in you. We ask these things in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the question I have for you is, what are you going to do now that revival is over? Amen. God has a question for us. How are we going to apply what we've learned, what we've experienced to our present day life now that the revival is over? There have been so many amazing sermons that we have heard, and now it's time to apply it to our lives. We may have experienced His wonderful Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God. We had His presence was here every service. We had visitors. We had people that were healed. We had a, a, a just a tremendous time. Some people got saved or maybe resaved. A young girl, like a teenager, got saved. Uh, somebody's grandmother got saved. I mean, what a tremendous time. People were reclaimed. Amen. We were uh, praying for the Holy Spirit. There were some, many people who were touched in their bodies, and we prayed for them, and they got healed. And what God has begun, amen, to do in your life, amen, it needs to be fulfilled. It needs to keep going. It needs to grow. Some were uh, healed immediately. Others began to be healed in their bodies. Amen. We need to continue to believe God for what He's begun and to press in for all that He has shown us and taught us. Because He has joy planned for us, a future destiny. So our greatest need uh, first is to just follow through. It's kind of like that banner. Some of you... Uh, maybe uh, sports enthusiasts, you know, that as, and just like golf, but, but baseball is the same way. Unless you follow through all the way with your bat as you're trying to uh, hit a home run. If you fall, if you pull back a little bit, if you're not giving it all the way, follow through. That your stroke, your swing is not going to be effective. We have to follow through with what God has shown us and quite simply do it. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you. Yes. Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is just the beginning of what he's planning on doing. Amen. And there may have been a seed dropped in your heart. Some kind of word or promise or something may have begun to sprout. And it's so tender and it's so gentle. You have to protect it. And you have to realize that maybe one day that will become a mighty oak tree. And believe God for what he's shown you. God has given each and every one of us a measure of revelation. We've been taught what scripture has revealed to our intellect. There's a certain process where we're learning certain things. And it's something that God deposits in our minds so that it can affect our lives, so that it can impact us. We're not just involved here in a religion, follow these rules, uh, sign on the dotted line, stand up, sit down, uh, you know, this kind of nonsense. It's something that comes from heaven. And if God speaks to you, how much more meaningful is that going to be in your life? It's going to carry you through all those trials all the doubts and the fears, something that's going to help you and I to, amen, follow through with what God has shown us. We may have learned who God is in a unique way. We may have learned a little bit about His character. Things may have been uh, revealed to us. We have been shown uh, His ability, His favor, and uh, especially what He wants to do for creation. And secondly, our need is to be fruitful in our lives, each and every one of us. Not simply entertained by an evangelist, although he was very funny, right? 
How many people enjoyed the evangelism? <laughs> Everybody raised your hands, right? He would do that. He would do some very funny things. And he had so many points of interest. And it's got to be a lot more than emotion and having fun and enjoying that. Or uh, learning things, you know. And then here's the test. You're going to take the test. You're going to fill out. You know, it's got to be more than that. There has to be something, amen, that brings fruitfulness to our lives. Otherwise, we could go watch a comedian or something, or go listen to a, a band play, or go to the theater, uh, or watch a movie. The evangelist makes you laugh sometimes, because you see how funny life is, or he might make you cry. There were several people that were crying in the service. My daughter said, look, that person's crying over there. It, it's got to be more than that. That's all good in the emotions, and he's pulling on your... Uh, heart strings, right? That's all good and, and uh, helpful, but something needs to be locked in to your soul so that you can become fruitful. Our greatest need is to take the lessons that were taught, every word that was preached, every illustration that was designed to show us what the kingdom of heaven was like, and every story that he told and apply it to our lives by faith. This is how you're going to be fruitful when you respond that way. Lastly, every individual who enjoyed Ralph Blanco's ministry, that eventually they would become fruitful and God's spirit would have right of way inside of them. Amen. So that they could put to work or put to use all the great things that Ralph the evangelist preached on. Amen. So I secondly want to uh, look at the promises of uh, God's word and what God promised your life. And I want to remind you about what Ralph preached on here. He preached four tremendous sermons. I'm not going to be able to remember every last detail of the sermons or, or just rehash it. But I want to bring your attention to a few points and maybe... They will quicken within you a little bit of something. Uh, he preached on Father's Day the, the, uh, the famous sermon being called Father. And he used the, the prodigal son story about how the, the son had taken his inheritance and uh, had left uh, uh, and squandered the money from Luke 15. I'm not going to read this whole scripture here to you because of time. But 11 through 24 begins like this. And uh, Jesus taught us certain men had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls unto me. And he divided them his living. And the son took it and, and wasted it, basically. But that whole idea of being called father, Ralph talked about what a privilege it is. For a man to be called a father. And you know God loves being called father. There's so many scriptures. And one comes to my mind in Isaiah. Uh, everlasting father. And uh, this parable that Jesus spoke about. To honor your father and mother also. Uh, one of the great ten commandments. Fathers uh, have the privilege of being called father. Like we have a. Heavenly Father. He talked about Noah and his children. Noah was able to build his boat with his children and save them, his sons, and give them a, ch a chance to live. Abraham was called Father Abraham because he believed and was the father of uh, uh, not only the entire Jewish race, but also the father of all those who have faith which include you and I. He's like a father to us also. God gives honor. Think about Joshua. Joshua claimed, uh, I don't know what you guys are going to do. I say that you should get rid of all your gods and you should worship the Lord your God. As for me and my house, my family, we are going to serve the Lord. So, amen, Joshua was also a father. And then lastly, we see Eli was one of the priests who had corrupt sons. He was not training them the right way. And they eventually failed and uh, were judged. 
one that, a funny note of uh, Ralph's sermon was talking about discipline. He said when his dad got mad and Ralph was there, he would grab anything, the closest object, right? He would grab a, a guitar and smash his son, right? Or a, a pull a, sweat, a, a branch off the tree and turn into a whip and discipline his son. He did it, you know, out of anger maybe or just out of necessity for sure. But Ralph approved to be turned out a pretty good guy because his father disciplined him. And lastly, and completely most importantly, was this idea of the blessing of the father. Ralph talked about the blessing that he conveyed upon his son at his wedding reception. And uh, they asked him, you know, normally we'd like somebody to pray over the, the food before we eat, right? So, so Ralph uh, said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Can I have a couple minutes? And he said, they said, yeah, go ahead, take your time. He grabbed the microphone and he said, son, stand up. And everybody, there was a hush over the crowd. <laughs> you know, this isn't got usual. And then he conveyed unto him a blessing. He said, come up here. And he put his hand on his forehead and his other hand behind his back. And he prayed for them in front of uh, everybody there. You can watch the sermon online in greater detail if you like. But he commanded him to be a man and to take care of his wife. And it was an amazing, an amazing prayer that he conveyed a blessing onto him, like the Jewish custom we read about in the Bible. There was not a dry eye in the place. Amen. As everybody was like, wow, this is incredible. That this man is, this father is passing on a blessing, an impartation to his son. The blessing of the father. And one of Ralph wishes for his uh, daughter and for, you know, for his, his daughter-in-law and for his son was that she would love God. She secondly would love him, uh, the, uh, the husband, and that they would love the in-laws, that the families would get along together, you know, because that can be a huge problem for them to get along. And uh, lastly, that uh, Ralph's son would marry a girl that was in our fellowship, because he's seen many other marriages that were wrecked because it was just a, not a good fix if somebody marries somebody from a different fellowship. They have different, you know, beliefs or ideas and so the, the successful marriages that Ralph has seen would be those who were married within the fellowship, and that is the best. He got this idea about praying for his son, of course from the Bible, but also he used an illustration in that reception. He talked about General Patton, who was about to go off to North Africa to uh, you know, be a general in uh, World War II. He found General Pershing who was uh, probably in a nursing home at this time because he was a World War I general. And he said, I want you to pray for me. So he said, okay, uh, George, you kneel down by my bed. And he laid his hand, this is a complete center. He's not a Christian. He said, I want you to lay your hands on me and convey a blessing to me. And so Pershing said, you know, go be a man and be successful. He didn't know how to pray. And uh, he laid his hand on Patton and he said, now go do it. And there's something of power to that as fathers will convey blessing to their children and to their sons. Amen. The second sermon was entitled, When Worry Becomes Dangerous, from 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Many people, he preached about how people are worried, they're anxious, and they're in, they're in fear. You know, the government loves to have uh, people in fear. And uh, many people are worried about their families. You know, are we going to have enough money? Are we going to be healthy? And uh, worries and fears contribute to many sicknesses and to early death. You can research this, and he noted that. This happens. Why? Because people are afraid. And they give themselves over to fear and worry and doubt. And it actually works like stress within your body. Like there's a real uh, problem. And it happens uh, to those 
people who think this way, and then it affects their body. Amen. And the result of that sermon was a fellow by the name of Wayne, who answered the altar call, who did not believe in God, was not into church at all, was not ready to convert. God brought him up to pray, and he got saved right here at this altar. It was glorious. And then we prayed for him. He has Parkinson's, and we prayed, and his wife testified uh, that his uh, hands aren't shaking like they used to. God is good. Amen. The last, I'm, I'm sorry, the third sermon was divine interruptions. And he used the scripture about how Saul was on his way to Damascus and he was, uh, he was messing around with the people of God. He was persecuting the Christians. You know that. He was doing business. He thought he was doing right. And his life was interrupted as God knocked him down. And he said, who are you, Lord? He's blinded. My God, there's interruptions in life. This is a good thing. And uh, the scripture says, He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting him? And uh, Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, he was convicted. He was fighting his conscience. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? The Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told what you should do. The interruption that God has for our lives should make us to question, God, what do you want me to do? What am I doing that's wrong, perhaps? Or what am I not doing that's right? And help me to know what you want me to do. Ralph was telling us he wanted to be a cop. He said, I'm going to be a cop. And he was a Christian, and his pastor said, hey, man, did you pray about it? He said, no, I'm going to be a cop. <laughs> and God said, no, you're not going to be a cop. You are going to be an evangelist. Right? And he was a pastor first. We learn how God gets our attention Right? It's, it's an interruption. We're doing, going about our own business. Hey, you know, I'm all set. And then God says, right here, stop. <laughs> and I've got something for you to do. It's an interruption. It's God. He invites us into an incredible relationship. Uh, a divine plan. Amen. So that we can be fruitful and useful. Amen. What an incredible relationship we have with Jesus Christ now since he's interrupted our lives. And we had, uh, uh, Ralph was preaching very interestingly in English and Spanish that night. He was interpreting his own words and preaching to a Spanish lady who came and actually got saved that night because God set her up and she just received Jesus into her heart. The last sermon was the one-two combination. Somebody remember this. He used the illustration about a famous fighter who was known for this deadly punch, this deadly move. It was a one-two combination. And that's when his opponent would fall to the mat and be punched out. Amen. We have a responsibility, Ralph taught us, to hear the word of God. That's the one. And then the two is... To believe. And to, that's where there's going to be a knockout in our lives. Something is going to happen when we combine those two together. Amen. And use Hebrews 4 verse 2. For unto us the gospel was preached as well unto them. But the word was not, uh, was not uh, mixed with faith when they heard it. And so therefore it affected one group of people. But the other group was not affected because they did not believe. We have two mindsets. Does anybody know what the two mindsets are from Ralph's sermon? In the back? No puedo. Good, Melissa. I can't. No puedo. 
No prayer though. No prayer though. I can't. I can't believe. I can't believe God. Or see prayer though. I can believe. So many people, either they fall in this camp or in this camp. No puedo, I can't believe they have no faith. Or, si sí puedo, I can believe. And those other people are the ones who get healed. And that's what we witnessed. Our faith mixed with the word of God delivers, pow, that knockout punch, and you will get your miracle. And the results of that service was a family, a Spanish-speaking family of three came down here and the guy was in his wheelchair because he was paralyzed. He had fallen off a roof. He's in an electric wheelchair. His wife came down and his daughter, all three of them prayed for salvation, which is glorious. And then Ralph prayed for the man because he's paralyzed. He can't move his legs. His wife is crying there because when Ralph prayed, the guy started moving his left leg. The guy was believing that he was putting all effort forward and the guy's left leg started to move. That's a miracle. That is results from believing. Let's close and uh, address the issue of what's going to happen after revival. How are you going to follow through and what are the great results of being obedient to what we've learned, to what we've experienced after revival. Our scripture here talks about our joy becoming full. First John uh, 1 verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things I write unto you, that your joy might be full. Our joy is directly linked to our obedience and to our follow-through with what God has shown us. Amen. How we respond reveals our own heart and shows us what God is doing inside of us as we're listening, as we're hearing the preaching. How are we going to respond? How will it benefit us? We've had an excellent experience. We were in God's presence. It was amazing. My pastor and his wife came. There was a tremendous amount of visitors here. Uh, uh, many people came and enjoyed God's presence. Do we continue in that obedience or do we forget about it and, you know, just chalk it up for a nice time? It was, it was you know, great, good, good, good job, you know. Or are we going to be walking in it and enjoying those promises that God has deposited in our souls? Walking with God will include ourselves giving us a further confidence a state of mind where we can continue to believe God, walking towards Him, pursuing God, running after Him sometimes, chasing after His will, and following Him will certainly make us much happier in our lives. Amen. As we let, amen, that revival have an impact upon us and help us and have our joy be filled. Revival is designed, uh, excuse me, defined by this man, he says, there is an emphasis on Jesus. There's also a repentance. We saw people who uh, were praying and they came forward to the altar. They said, I will not live that way anymore. I'm going to change my life. That's called repentance. Many people didn't make it down. Maybe they didn't answer the altar call. But in their minds, they were saying, yeah, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop thinking that way. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to repent. I'm going to put away the old life. And I'm going to go after my new life. Repentance. There was a passion for prayer, man. We were praying before the service. People were praying in the service, crying out to God. There was a hunger for the Word of God. There was a burden for the lost. We uh, handed out thousands 
almost 2,000 flyers, that means that there is a burden upon those who invite people to know God. There's a burden to know God. And there's an increase in salvation. We had dozens of visitors, and uh, five people were saved throughout the week. And uh, they, this man says there's also a surge or a call to become a minister or to become a missionary. And that means to lay down your life. That happens in uh, true revivals. And the manifest presence of God. And this is how I want to close this sermon and bring to your attention the main spirit of Ralph Blanco. This is what Ralph has impressed upon my soul. And that is a spirit of reconciliation. I don't know any of you, if you can, you know, conf confer this with me, but he had this spirit that he was like begging you, please, I want you to know that this is real. I want you to be saved. God really loves you. And he had this, this compassion that is, I've never heard any other evangelist or any but he preached quite like him at all. And I get my scripture from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 11 through 21. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known to your consciences. He had an incredible ability to warn people about eternity. That's what that scripture is talking about. But to draw people with a sincerity and to let them know that this is the heart of God. We persuade men. And then I went on outreach last night. I went down to uh, Walmart. And I, with this in mind, I was trying to persuade men about how good Jesus is. And what he's done for me. And what the scripture says about his reality. And what he can do for them. I wound up praying with four people last night. It was glorious. There was one guy who was... Uh, an older guy who's kind of mixed. I started speaking Spanish to him. He said, no, I'm not Mexican. <laughs> he said, I'm mixed. It was pretty cool. And then we talked about Jesus. And as he was walking away, he said, man, will you pray for me? I said, yeah, come on back here. We prayed for salvation. He got saved. Gave me his phone number. Another three, a group of young men were in their car. They were all done shopping. Actually, they loaded the ice cream in the trunk. They didn't tell me that. But we spent a half an hour talking about Jesus. And I prayed with all three of them because God is so good. Amen. That's good. Give God glory if you want to. Thank you, Lord God. Reaching men, persuading them, outreaching, evangelism, and witnessing is those are the kind of words that we attach to this scripture that we have to learn how to uh, reach people and love them. And that whole message you know, be reconciled to God. Get your heart right while there's time. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12. We do not commend ourselves again to you, but we give you the opportunity to boast in our behalf that you may have an answer for those who are, are, are boasting in appearance, but not in heart, for we are beside ourselves. Paul saying, I'm crazy as if it were for God. If we uh, are not of sound mind, it is for you. But the love of Christ compels us because we judge this. If one died for all, then all died. And he talks about Jesus dying and rising from the dead. But he says that we are compelled or we're forced or constrained to tell other people about Jesus. We live now for Christ and Christ compels us to love other people and to share the love of God with people who are lost and on their way to hell. And it's just an incredible spirit that Ralph demonstrated. Amen. Reconciling others to Christ. Bringing two parties together who were once separated. Amen. So that they can be rejoined together. Working out your differences is normally the way we understand that word reconciliation. And those can become a new creation. Those sinners God loves sinners and wants to bring them into his kingdom so badly that he let his own son bleed on that cross. We are ambassadors for Christ, verse 20 says, as though God were pleading through us. 
We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. It's like he's on his knees begging them. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Ralph Blanco is such a classy guy. What a great spirit he had, inviting people to Christ with such a demonstration as an ambassador for heaven. Amen. And that, I believe, was conferred to me. And I would like you to think about letting that be conferred to you also. As if God were pleading to humanity through us. Amen. Ralph deposited in my soul a great love, a sincere desire that all people would come to Christ, be forgiven, be reconciled, be healed. Amen. Ralph was the real deal. Amen. Had the right spirit. Acting like Christ, acting like Paul, reasoning and pulling people towards God. And you and I can do the same thing. You and I can acquire a large heartedness, a desire to, you know, compel people, to convince them, to, to draw them to the cross and to salvation. Amen. Becoming soul winners. God can amplify a desire inside of us to love people and sincerely just draw them out of their sin and into the kingdom of God. So my question to you, I'm going to close. What are you going to do after revival? Are you going to let all those things penetrate the depths of your soul and make you different? Because if you do, you will be blessed and you will be filled with joy. Amen. Let's close our eyes if we can this morning. And let's just call out to God and believe God for a miracle in your life. Maybe you're not saved or you're backslidden. You're out of fellowship with God. Scripture here says that we come into fellowship with God. We come into a, a friendship, into a relationship, into uh, 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 an ability to share our heart with Him. God can share His heart with us too because we are uh, like we're in a family. We're related uh, by blood, amen. And Jesus Christ loves you so much that he died for your sins. If you're not saved or you're backslidden, I'm going to challenge you to give your life to Christ. Turn away from your sin. Give your life to God. Jesus has paid the penalty for sin on the cross where he shed his blood completely, perfectly, and innocently for you. Jesus the Lamb of God was sacrificed so that you could come to know God, come into relationship with God. I'm going to challenge you to raise your hand this morning. I'm not right with God. I'm out of fellowship with God. And I want so dearly to give my life to Christ. I'm asking that you would pray for me, Pastor. And that's you. You want to get saved or you want to get right with God. And then we're not guaranteed tomorrow, but you know what? There is hope for all mankind. And that's you, perhaps. You feel God's tugging in your heart. Man, your, your soul is burdened with sin. You want to get rid of them, my friend. You're like in a train wreck. You have body pieces all over the place. This, this weight is upon your soul and you can't move because of sin. You're involved in a curse. There's, you're damaged. Your mind is twisted. You don't have any hope. And I'm here to give it to you. I'm here to proclaim that Jesus Christ has died for you because of love. He wants to save you. With an uplifted hand, you want to pray. And then that's you all across the building. And then maybe you're online and you're sensing that, that convicting in your heart. Yeah, I, and that's me. You're talking about me. I need to get saved. I need to make some decisions. I need to change. And you want to pray. I'd like to pray with you right now. Let's take a moment to, while every head is bowed here. No one's looking around. And you would like to pray that prayer with me. 
Say, Jesus, I am lost. I am not a sinner. I'm not right. I'm a sinner. I am sorry for my decisions. <laughs> I'm asking you to help me change my life. Make me a new creation. I repent of my old life. Wash me in your blood and cleanse my conscience so that I can serve you and serve you faithfully. I thank you for this prayer. I thank you for dying on the cross. And I thank you for this ministry. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'll be back here tonight. You can come and introduce yourself. Amen. In the Toys R Us Plaza, we'll be here at 5.30 for prayer, 6.30 for our evening service. Why don't we stand up and change the order of the service, and I'd like to open the altars if you'd like to come forward and pray. Amen. You want to leave this up? Praise God. Let's sing with our sister.
This morning, we'll be back this evening at 5.30. We're going to pray and get a hold of God and also have our second service at 6.30. Amen. If you're online, I'm going to encourage you to show up and uh, believe God for a miracle. Expect God to do something tremendous in your life. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Can we bow our heads? Lord, you're an awesome God. We uh, are expecting miracles, God, because of your involvement in our lives. God, help us to uh, continue to follow through with everything that we've learned throughout the revival. And I pray the spirit of Ralph Blanco and every individual here, Lord God, help us to be a reconciling ambassador, a soul winning and a soul reaching church. God, touch every individual here, Lord God, and bring great joy. God, as we return safely in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Have a great day, amen, and a wonderful week. Praise the Lord.